Uh, start. So, so the first. Uh, is it on? The, I think it's on, yeah. Okay, I put it on, yeah. Perfect. So, the first uh, speaker of the last day is uh, Vittorio Venturi from ICGB, who is going to talk about. Uh, quorum sensing. Quorum sensing. The, the title was a bit too. <laughs> I thought too specific for, uh, so I'm a Vittorio, I'm a, actually I'm a bacteriologist, completely experimental, so um, recently with our studies we, we need to, you know, we need to think more uh, along the lines of modeling, along the lines of what's happening, as I hope I will show you what I will do today, I will do a bit of an historical uh, story of my work. Uh, as you can imagine, science, I mean, I'm, I'm quite old, I'm getting old. And the way, we're doing the way I was doing research when I started in 1989, it's just completely crazy what the way we're doing it today. I mean, if somebody came to me in 1990 and said, you know that in 20, whatever you could do, ABC, I would think it would be fantascienza. But now, so the, the scenario has changed completely. But, uh, and also, you know, uh, listening to some of the talks and talking to some of you, you guys are big thinkers, you know, uh, and what is, some a bit intimidated actually. Because in my, in my world, we think a lot less. You know? Just to give you an example, uh, just to give you an example, I have a PhD student who started last October, and we want to understand whether which protein is interacting with a protein that, that we have, which I don't know, we don't know how it works. So we have to do some interaction studies. And he's working for one year, setting up the experiment to pull down, to try to understand how this, which, which protein this protein interacts with. So my student, for one year, is not really been thinking too much because all he's been doing is cloning, preparing the, the, the experiment in order to pull down the proteins that this protein interacts with. So this is very much our world, you know. Uh, we, the thinking time is, is not very much, in, uh, in my view, compared to your thinking time. So sometimes we actually, actually uh, have to remember to think, and also my students and all of us have to think of the big pictures because we get bottled down with everyday technical problems. It's getting better because the technology is, is, really, uh, is really changing. So this is the first message I want to give you. My world is very different from yours, but uh, that, uh, you know, now that I have several students, I can spend more time thinking. And I would like to, what I'd like to do today, just put, put, on the, put forward where, what we've done and, and also maybe some ideas that I can maybe collaborate or maybe you guys can, can, can illuminate, me, uh, illuminate us uh, in some of the questions that we are, we're trying to ask, especially in the last few years. So I'm... I've started working on this uh, in the 90s uh, on this uh, quorum sensing, and it all started with this picture here. And you can see here squids, basically, which uh, actually uh, illuminate, uh, which are making bioluminescence. Okay? These guys are, are living in, uh, in the deep sea and in, where there is uh, very little light or no light. Okay? Um, and what, uh, what in the US a uh, few scientists discovered, isolated the bacteria actually, that was making a symbiotic relationship with some of these squids. And the, and the bacteria is called Vibrio fischeri, is now changed name again. You know, taxonomists are driving us crazy. You know, uh, uh, species, new species are found every day, names are changed. But, uh, so if you look in Google, you'll find Vibrio fischeri, and it's called Allio fischeri, and this is a gram negative bacterium, and you can see here. It's a, it's a Vibrio family, you probably heard of Vibrio cholerae, uh, which is, uh, causes cholera, it's, the same, it's, the same, uh, it's very closely related, but obviously this is not a pathogen. And you can see here, if you grow it in the lab, in plate or in liquid, it makes light, it makes bioluminescence. And then scientists were really, were really uh, interested by this. Uh, uh, why it makes light and how it makes light. And to make a very long story short, again here is 15 years of work to try and discover this, is what they discovered is that actually what this Vibrio does, it produces a signal, a, a signal, uh, a chemical signal, which is diffusible and it can get in and out of cells without any transport, so it just diffuses. And, uh, and this, this signal is pr basically produced all the time. And so if you have, a, 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 as the population, as the number of cells increases, so does the concentration of the signal. And at a certain point, at a certain concentration, you get bioluminescence, you get production of light. Right? So it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a social behavior, right? And this is something also that we bacteriologists had to completely change our mindset. Uh, you know, when I, when I went to university, I was taught that bacteria are unicellular organisms. 
you know, each fighting for their, own life, for their own survival, but actually what we have to put in our mind today, the bacteria are social organisms. Bacteria produce a lot of factors which are secreted. You know, if you look at streptomyces, it can produce up to 200 proteins that it throws out in the medium. It can produce 600 metabolites, which it throws out. So you, you can appreciate that if you spend so much energy to do that, you're socially, you're, you're, you're doing it for, for yourself and for your neighbors. So it's a, it's a social behavior. In fact, in 2013, the term social microbiology was coined just because of, we realized how social these, these organisms are. So then, so, so then in, in, uh, in, in, in 1994, Clay Fuqua, Green, Greenberg, and Steve Winans in the US coined the term quorum sensing. So you're sensing a quorum of cells. And this is kind of a revolution in our world, and I lived it because it was a completely new thing. And, I, and, and at the time when this was actually discovered, it was thought to be a kind of, to be a, uh, like an exception, a very uh, new thing for this bacteria, but actually what, what is now the scenario is that, well, in my view, all bacteria, which are living organisms, communicate. Why shouldn't a living organism like a bacteria not communicate? Bacteria communication is so important for life. And so here we have a, a communication system which regulates group behavior, right? And this is really taken off among the bacteriologist world, and, uh, and I'll show you some slides now uh, of, the, of just some of the phenotypes here, particularly going to the Vibrio fischera. The latest model today is, is that uh, these squids have a light organ in their belly or underneath. And what this light organ does, it, don't ask me why, because I find it fascinating that the sea is full of microbes, but this guy is able to select in this organ to really take in this guy specifically. It takes it in, it gives it food. This guy grows uh, up to cell densities up to 10 to the 9 cells per milliliter because of the nice food that the squid gives. And in exchange, the bacteria will make light a high cell density. And the latest theory is that making light in your belly will avoid, will avoid a shadow that the moon will give you if you don't. So you, and then the predators, some predators just open their mouth and eat. if something is shadowed, they just eat it. In this way, uh, the latest theory that this allows the squid to survive and to fight predators. These are some of the signals then, uh, you know, this, this field took off completely. In my view, we're still the tip of the tip of the iceberg. We found uh, this, we found very, very few signals. There's many, many more out there to be found. So microbes, you know, fungi, bacteria, archaea, they're all making signals, which is their language. This is just a picture. You can see, just to show you here, this is, you know, some of them. And you can see they're quite simple. I'm not a chemist, but I can tell you they're rather simple and diffusible. They, they don't need too many genes to be synthesized, uh, and they move around rather quickly uh, in the media. And you can see here in a slide, you know, again, scientists went, really went crazy. This is a new thing. And you can see here the kind of phenotypes, the kind of behaviors that are regulated by this communication. We heard sporulation in the meeting, showed you bioluminescence, pigmentation. You know, we have beautiful bacteria in the lab. They're not pigmented. They grow, they grow, and suddenly they become colored. So signaling regulates pigmentation, which is a, which pigmentation helps bacteria to, for example, resist predators. It's got anti antimicrobial activity. It helps bacteria resist UV light and so on and so forth. Movement, biofilm formation. See, all, all phenotypes related to, to the community, not to the single cell, okay? And importantly, of course, you know, uh, money. You need to work with pathogens. You know, if, if, you live, if you want to do research in Italy, and I do research in environmental science, there's basically very little funding. 98% of the funding is on biomedical sciences. But anyway, timely production of virulence factors. If you're a pathogen, you get into a host, a plant, or a, or a human, or an animal. The last thing you want to do is reveal yourself to the immune system of your host, right? So, so and usually, to reveal yourself is when you, start, when you start firing. It's a bit like humans go to war. If they start firing, uh, the enemy knows you're there, right? So they have to fire at the right time. And the right time is really when there is a, a if, you, if, you, if you're able to, 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 uh, to, to enter a host, for example, I'm interested in plants, and bacteria enter in plants, and then they can hide and, and, and grow and reproduce, and at the right time throw out their enzymes or their, their you know, um, their toxins, 
And that's the time when the plant knows, oh, wow, and then the supply can defend. But so there's this Trojan horse uh, strategy of defense that, that bacteria can use through communication. So initially, they, they grow and establish. Then they recognize each other, and then they attack. And attacking when there's a lot of you, uh, you're more likely to survive, just like humans go to war. It's basically yeah, a, a similar scenario. Get food. Well, you know, when you're a large number, you kill the other cells and you release you release you release food for the for the community. Yeah. 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 Okay, but the the, the attacking, so the making of the enzyme or the making of the toxin, then that's the moment that the plant you know perceives that uh, responds to those signals and then produces factors which will then counteract the, the bacteria. I don't know, antimicrobial peptides or reinforce the, the, the plant cell, the, those plant cell wall, okay? So the, the recognition, the fighting between the pathogen and the plant, for example, is... Uh, because they, I think the major, the major reason for, their, for that is growth. Uh, they need it for growth. Yeah, they kill the cells. The cells release. They kill vegetable cells or whatever cells, and the cells release food, and the bacteria can grow more and more. Okay, thank you. I'll show you some more example later about this food thing. How is it? Uh, how do? How is it possible? Sorry to show that it's uh, current sensing and does not like, for example, in this case. They are in a higher density, so the exhaust nutrient around them and really the signal is not like a molecule they emit, but rather sort of like a change of the environment that comes with the cell density, but that is not properly spoken current sensing. How do we differentiate well, this? Well, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of data on this. You know, we have mutants that don't make the signal. We I have see, mutants okay. that don't perceive the signal. There's a lot of data on that. Right. There are ways to stop the signal, uh, to degrade the signal. So there's a lot of strategy there. There's over 100 patents now on blocking the signaling, and it showed that it's less virulent. So there's a lot of data there. Okay. Right. And a second question, sorry. Of course, of course. Um, are there documented uh, cases where another species of bacteria could use this current sensing to sort of uh, lead? I'll come to that. Yeah, it's a very oh, okay. good question. I'll come to that. I'll come to that. This is one of the things I'm getting into. And uh, OK. So, so you can imagine the, the, the excitement that we lived. You know, our world as a you know, microbiologist is a bit of the Cinderella of science in, if you go to university departments, you know, a uh, bacteriologist, you know. But then, you know, PCR, enzymes, PCR, now uh, genome editing is all thanks to discovering bacteria. But we have this kind of life, you know, our bacteriologists, you know. We go down and then we discover, we find, we make a revolutionary discovery, we become popular again. And then, so this you can imagine. And also program cell death was discovered first in microbes as well. So, you know, this was an incredible excitement uh, and, you know, communication, group behavior. And you can imagine the applications. Because here you, you have a, a strategy to control an infection, but not killing the bacteria. Because killing the bacteria like antibiotics does, the pressure for resistance is enormous. But, but stopping virulence, gene expression, has much less implication of resistance. So there's a lot of, as I said, a lot of patents, a lot of scientists studying ways to block this communication because then, in a way, you, you render the, the pathogen much less pathogenic and you can control the disease. Uh, okay, so, so I, I just want to get in now my, my, what I'm trying to get, what my work here in Trieste is, I'm working with, these, uh, with this signal, which is called almost serine lactone. I just don't want to talk at all about the chemistry. All I want to say is that, you know, it's very simple to synthesize. And there's lots of different dialects to this language. You know, the, the R2, the chain, can be up to 20 carbons, and the R1 you can substitute. So you, within this family of signal, you have a lot of specificity. So a lot of species can make its own type of uh, almost serine lactone. And it is so simple and so powerful. You need one gene to make this signal. Because this enzyme opportunistically takes precursors that are present actually in every living cell. If you take this gene, and put it, for example, in a human cell or in a plant cell, it will make the signal, right? So what you have is that you have one gene coding for one enzyme and making, basically making the signal all the time. And of course, what happens, as I already showed you before, high cell density, there'll be more signal. 
and it's diffusible and it will, it will, it will interact direct, directly one-to-one -one stoichiometry and a very strong interaction with a regulator, a sensor regulator, that will go and then when there's this interaction, this, the activator becomes functional or I'll show you later or maybe not functional and affect target gene expression. It will switch on bioluminescence, it will switch on genes related, they will control phenotypes, community phenotypes. But one very important thing is the positive feedback loop. So the first gene that it regulates is, 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 the, is the gene for the synthesis of the signal. So there's a very fast and strong amplification to make more signal. And this, the mechanism is so simple, you have uh, this activator actually, if you're interested in biochemistry, the binding to the signal will create a homodimer, so two polypeptides come together. Each polypeptide is bound to one signal. And in most cases, 90% of the scenario, then this uh, homodimer activator will bind to a DNA promoter and activate transcription of the target gene. There are also scenarios where the homodimer will bind DNA, which is when it's unbound to the signal, so it represses, and binding to the signal will, will make it unable to bind DNA and release release the repression, and then the, 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 the gene will be transcribed. So you have both, both uh, and there are implications of the two, which, which is better to use depending on the gene and blah, blah, but I don't want to, just to show you that uh, bacteria can use both, but by far activation is the, chose, is, uh, is, the, is the most common. And what I've done, <laughs> I started to work in the, 90, in the late 90s. I just want to show this picture. I worked with rice as the model system of my plant. Sorry, short question. Oh, oh, sorry. Do they pump the molecule out, or is it just diffusing? Very out? good question. Very good question. The, the, as I was saying before, there are different dialects. Uh, it is, it is uh, diffusible, but there are reports that the larger molecules, the one with a long side chain, they do, they can, they, there are some transporters which help pumping it out. It can still diffuse, but there is some help to pump it out for the, for the bigger ones. So I, 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 I work with rice uh, for obvious reasons. It's the most important uh, cereal crop in the world. It's two and a half billion people eat it three times a day. So I thought, why not work with rice? Which are the bacteria which are most important with ri that interact with rice? Both good and bad. Because most bacteria that interact with plants, I'll show you in a second, are good. Are absolutely, it's like we, we live with, with uh, three kilograms of bacteria, especially in our gut. So do plants, as I'll show you in a second. So I worked a lot with pathogens and, 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 uh, and beneficial, but I don't want to get into historical data and publication. What I, what I want to show you is that in our world, experimental world, very often you start with looking for something and you look and you find, and you have to move away, you find something that you didn't expect and then and you get excited and then you investigate it. This is what happened. So when I was looking for these, I isolated these bacteria, and we're talking about the pre-genomic era here, so some of you young guys have to click a little bit in your head that we had no genomes. There was no automatic sequencing. I did, I did all my sequencing by hand, you know, no oligonucleotides. And so anyway, so we didn't have any, any. So I was taking these bacteria from friends all over the world. Send me these bacteria that you isolated. And I got these bacteria and I, and I was looking for these signals in a, using sensors using or chemistry. And we found a lot that most of them have except these two, a, a very important pathogen, I don't want to get into the very important pathogen, and very important beneficial bacteria that live next to the roots, which next to the root, one millimeter, two millimeter of soil is called the rhizosphere, and it's basically the gut of plants. It's a perfect parallelism. It does a lot, so many important things that micro, microbial community, I'll, I'll show you in a second. But these guys, I couldn't find the signals. They didn't make them. So, you know, it was the nine, late 90s, I thought, ah, oh, these guys don't communicate, which is, you know, now we know that so many signals can be made. I was just looking for one, you know, I was, I was looking for one language, but they can speak other languages. Anyway, what, what we found, what I, I want to go fast, what we found, because then genomes started coming out, is that these bacteria, they really puzzled us immediately. We found that they have the gene, basically the protein, for detecting the signal, but they didn't have the gene for making the signal. And these two genes are, in fact, always next to each other in chromosomes. So we had scenarios that bacteria that lost the, the, the gene that makes the signal, but retained the gene to respond to the signal. And this is when I co we coined the term in 2009, 
with my, oh, but the, uh, we coined the term, uh, this is not the new slide that I made, Luxar Solo, we coined that term. So a, Lux, a regulator which is a solo, which that doesn't have a cognate signal. Because you know, you have the signal gene, generating gene which makes that signal, and you have the specific regulator that will respond best to that particular structural signal. So then we started, we started hypothesizing with these guys. Do these bacteria respond to signals made by other bacteria? So like eavesdropping, you know? Or do they respond to a, pla to a plant? Because already in the early 2000s, there were groups in the US saying, oh, plants could make these same signals as bacteria make. And so they could interfere or they could mix up with the signaling, you know? And to make it long story short, what we found is that, oops, is that actually these bacteria that we were, work that we were studying have lost the ability We've shown that they don't respond to homocerin lactone, but they respond to a plant signal, which is not homocerin lactone. So basically what I'm telling you here is that then we did a lot of work and we showed that uh, this is basically an interkingdom signaling system, bacteria, this plant communicating with the bacteria. And in the case of the, path one is a pathogen, in the case of the pathogen, the pathogen perceives the signal, ah, I'm inside the plant and it starts doing, it starts behaving like inside the plant. And, and, and the good guy living in, in, in the rhizosphere near, next to the root, oh, I'm next to the plant, I start doing something good for you, for the plant in exchange for food. So this is what I'm saying. But then, you know, genomics exploded, so we went back to the, to the databases and we showed that this, this particular regulator, which has specific primary structure, amino acid feature, sequence features, is very, well, is very well conserved in bacteria. Sorry, you can't read them, but all of these bacteria are plant-associated. So it's only homologous to plant-associated bacteria. So basically, what probably happened is that this guy, this system was a classical signal, signal producer, signal sensor, through evolution, is, it lost the signal generator. There's a few changes of amino acids in the, in the domain here. I didn't show you here. This, this is a modular protein. These looks are about, sorry, again, the figure is not complete, 250 amino acids. And there is, at the end terminus, a domain that responds to the signal. And the, and the C terminus, the domain that binds DNA. So there's been changes in that domain that then is no longer able to bind to almost relaxone, but it can bind to a plant signal. And then this guy then distributed incredibly among plant-associated bacteria. Now we have a new signaling system between plant and bacteria. And then, yeah, to make, uh, I, don't, I don't have the slides, but then one of my PhD students went to Pete Greenberg in, the, in, the, in Seattle, who is the, who's basically the, the father figure of quorum sensing, and she identified the signal, and she published really PNAS papers and so on and so forth about which is the signal and what, how, the mechanistic aspect of this system. But, what I want to tell you here is that the genomics era really changed us. This is why we, beautiful to do this work as technologies come in, you really, your view of science complete, you know, the, the, the things you can do are basically amazing. So basically we discovered this, this setup that we, we have a regulator that no longer produces signal. The, and we, we coined this term looks our solos and then we started going to the genome. For example, we went to our favorite pseudomonas is a general bacteria that are friendly, very friendly, and live in, in the gut of plants. And uh, they, in fact, they are so abundant in the gut of plants. They do so many good things like help, help plants get food, keep pathogens away, uh, produce plant hormones so the root grows better, blah, blah, so on and so forth. What we look, we looked at 612 genomes of these pseudo, the scientists, including us, we sequenced 50 or so, but the scientists have sequenced of, of these beneficial guys, and we found that 82% have Luxar solos compared to 17% having a complete Lux IR system. So a system that makes a signal and detects a signal. Basically, what's happening is that it's far more common to have a Luxar solo than being a, being a bacteria that makes the signal and responds to the signal. Don't think that it doesn't communicate. Maybe it makes other signals. And what I can tell you then, we, then we do even more genomics here. I have a close collaboration with Azaf Levy in, in Israel, who's a microbial genomic, genomics, fantastic microbial genomic scientist. And we could, we, could, we could identify nine different subgroups based on the primary structure and the adjacent genes of these solos in pseudomonas. 
So we think we have nine different types of Luxor solos. We think three are binding AHLs, so they listen to, they eavesdrop to, to AHLs, almost like produced by the bacteria. But the other six, one of them is the one, that, the green one, that binds to the plant signal, but then the others, we don't know what they do. Maybe they bind to other plant signals, maybe they respond to fungi, maybe they, we don't know. But the message I wanna, I wanna give you is that you can see here how, uh, I'll, I'll come to it later, how uh, bacteria which live in a, in a very complex community basically are specializing their cell-to-cell -cell signaling systems. And then, of course, we, we just wrote, a, we, then we get excited with Azaf, and we just published a big, a big study, big review in, uh, where we looked at 23,000 genomes, and we mapped all the Luxor solos in protobacteria, and we can see, and we try to combine Luxor solo with the ecology. So maybe we find a subgroup of Luxor solo, uh, we found one among plant-associated bacteria, do we find one with enteric bacteria, do we find one with with water, uh, you know, soil-borne bacteria or water-borne bacteria in order to try and to see uh, if a specific Luxor solo will have a specific function in an environment. I hope I'm not boring you with too much, uh, but anyway, but this, but the, you know, uh, the message I want to give here is now, through our studies and also then other scientists are also studying Luxor solos, is that we have, at the moment, five scenarios. One scenario is that, it's been shown also by Pete Greenberg, is that you have a Luxor solo in a bacteria that actually has a Lux-IR complete system and a response to the signal that it produces. So you have two sensors. One is a solo and one is a cognate that responds to the signal. So it just amplifies the ability your ability to respond to the signal that you make. We have a Luxar solo that responds to AHLs, homocerine lactone, in a bacteria that doesn't make homocerine lactone. The classic example is E. coli, salmonella, salmonella and E. coli. You have Luxar solos that respond to signals which are made endogenously but are not AHLs. They have a different structure, slightly different structure. We have signal, Luxar solos that I've shown you, the one we discovered that responds to plant signals. And we have Luxor solos that, that, that work in a ligand independent manner. They just, they just activate all the time. So these are the five scenarios we have at the moment. So the message here I want to give is that we think that these quorum sensing systems, central cell signaling systems, uh, in, in particularly classes of bacteria like these bacteria that live in very complex community in soils that I'll talk about now, which, which you are very unlikely to have isolated densities because the microbiome of the, of the, the soil microbiome today is the most biodiverse microbiome there is. There's tens of thousands of species also in there. So we have a scenario which is very different from the Vibrio Fisher I showed you. And maybe the, there's a specialization going on in terms of cell-to-cell -cell signaling. There's a different requirement that these bacteria need to use in order to survive in this very complex mix, mixed communities. And, and uh, so, so, you know, the, the rhizosphere is something that, and the soil is something that interests us a lot. And as I was saying to you, <laughs> we're doing microbiome studies in these environments and, and the complexity is enormous. So, yeah, so it's very, so we have to think of this. So we have to really think, rethink, you know, we have to, we're, you know, we are, we are now finding, as I show you, finding that quorum sensing is actually, the decision making, the on-off system is much more complex. Mm -hmm. And, this, and there's a lot of specialization taking place. And also, what we are seeing, and I'll show you now, what we are seeing, and we want to advocate, is that pathogens, pathogens uh, have a different requirement compared to maybe a soil or a, a soil or rhizosphere bacterium. So what we did, for example, we looked at diseases of rice here, uh, different diseases, and I'm answering your question, you know, some diseases cause rotting. We did what's called the pathobiome. So we determined the whole bacterial and fungal community of these diseases. And what I could tell you, for example, in one of these diseases here, the, one of the diseases that causes uh, uh, grain rot, which is, uh, sorry, sheath rot, which is very common in, in Africa. And uh, basically, when you grow rice at high altitudes, you get this, uh, you know, the sheath is what covers the panicle just before the panicle forms, and that rots. And it rots because the bacteria make toxins and enzyme. Cells die and get food. So we went there, and what I can, can tell you is that if we look at a healthy sheath, a healthy, a healthy sheath has basically very little pathogen. But a, a sick sheath, where you have the symptoms of the disease, 30% of the bacterial load 
of that community is the pathogen. So here we have a dramatic change, right? And then we do all the analysis and we see that, we see that, that, uh, uh, in that in, when, the, when the plant is healthy, there is a very biodiverse community. When the plant is sick, 30% of the bacterial load is the pathogen and the other 70% the other is affected dramatically. And then we, we, we looked at this more carefully and what, what we found using, studying another disease is studying a disease of olive called olive knot disease. And this is here, you see this is uh, an olive, a one-year-old one -year olive plant and here we infect with this pathogen. And after 60 days you get this knot. It's also called a tumor or you can call it a gall. You see these things here. And this is a bacteria and this bacteria we've shown that it communicates through the signaling system just like the Vibrio Fischer eye and if we knock out, like the question that somebody asked me, if I knock out the ability to communicate, to produce a signal, or respond to a signal, you can see a new effect. Here, this is a bacteria that doesn't make the signal. This is a bacteria that doesn't respond to the signal. You can see if you infect, the, basically the knot is, not, is, is basically non-existent, but it's very small. So if, you're not, if you cannot communicate, then you don't produce the virulence factors that make this knot. Basically, you send the, you send the plant in apoplasia, uh, the cell, cell division goes crazy and they start giving a lot of food to the bacterial community. But what I want to talk about here is that, you know, when I was contacted by a scientist from Morocco working in Perugia in Italy, he said, can I come to your lab to, to study whether this pathogen, Pseudomonas savastanoi, uses the cell-to-cell -cell signaling system for pathogenesis? And I said, I wasn't too excited because it already a plethora of articles of other pathogen, uh, other plant pathogens that use the system for pathogenicity. So if we find it, okay, we just, we just join the family, but we don't find anything new. But what really excited me is that, you know, Vittorio, when I go to the field, take the knot, isolate the pathogen from the knot, I always isolate, basically I always isolate another bacteria called Ervinia tolitana, which was actually published, uh, it was actually, the species was actually coined in, 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 in 2004 by, in Spain. In fact, Toletana means, comes from Toledo. And the Spanish scientists said, Irina Toletana is a novel species associated with the savastanoi induced tree knot of the pathogen. So I thought, wait a minute, here we have a pathogen that comes in, takes over, 30, 34, in fact, here we did the microbiome, 50% of the community inside the knot is, is the pathogen. But there's this guy, and this guy is known to be harmless. It's a, it's a bacteria that lives together with harmless or beneficial. There's not a lot of studies, but definitely not, not a pathogen. So then we started asking questions. What's going on between, you know, this guy is the pathogen, is the niche maker. You know, he uses all his energy, and, and he's evolved to make this beautiful, uh, this really nice uh, niche, this nice living quarter. And this guy, is he a cheat? Is he somebody that takes, is he a bacteria that takes advantage and cheats and takes the resources from the solid knot? Or is he a collaborator of the pathogen? So we started working with this. And again, you know, you, this is the idea, but then you have to work a year to. So the first thing we found out, which was, which was uh, immediately interesting, is that the pathogen and the Irvinia make the same signal. So they speak exactly the same language. So the Irvinia also has a signal generator and a signal responder, exactly the same, just like the pathogen. And we thought that was interesting. And then we knocked, and then we inactivated, we made all the possible mutants. And what I show you here is infections or co-infections. So as I already showed you, this is uh, the knot volume of one-year-old olive plants that we infected. And when we infect with a pathogen, just a pathogen alone, we have, after 60 days, a nice olive knot, as I've shown you before in pictures. When, when, we, when we infect the pathogen with Irvinia toletana, the harmless, we have bigger knots. So already that was an indication, significantly bigger knots. So it means that when they're together, they probably both benefit. Then we did a, an experiment which really blew me away. And I already showed you, when we infect with the pathogen, they cannot communicate, cannot produce, generate the signal. The knot was very small. But when, I co when we co-infect with the mutant of the pathogen that doesn't make the signal, 
with the wild type Arena Toletana fungus. We can rescue the knot. So basically, that was telling me these guys are living together, and now the mute, the pathogen that doesn't make the signal, can take can use the signal made by the by the uh, the Arrhenia, by the harmless bacteria. When we co-infect with the pathogen that doesn't make the signal, with the with the with the harmless Arrhenia that doesn't make the signal, we don't have the knot. And what is important, if we do the same experiment, but we use the mutant of the pathogen, the regulatory mutant, so the, 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 the mutant that cannot sense the signal, even if we put the wild type that makes a signal, we don't, we don't rescue the knot. So basically, this was evidence that we were sharing a signal. Uh, that, that here, it was in vivo, in planta, there was these two bacteria are living together and they share their signals. They, they speak the same language and they talk to each other. And in fact, then we went, and this is a very also important experiment we did. Uh, we measured through the 60 days of the knot cell counts. How many cells in the knot? And here in, in open circles, this is the pathogen. You can see that through the, as the knot increases, you have more pathogen. Then we measured the pathogen when, you, when we did the co-infection. You can see we have more pathogen to go infect. So the pathogen grows better when there is the Irvinia. And this is even more dramatic. If we measure the Irvinia, these are, these are, if we infect with Irvinia, in fact, we just put, yeah, in fact, we put Irvinia in the plant alone, basically it disappears in 60 days. It cannot grow very well. But the, if we measure the Irvinia when we also have the pathogen, look at it, the Irvinia is so happy. It can grow. So, and then uh, we went to Cayo Ramos, fantastic guy, a really nice guy in, in Malaga, who's basically the world leader, works studying this, 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 this disease, and he has all the model, he has the plant lit, he has the epifluorescence. Yeah. See if you program. The knot is bigger. Yes. But this, this value is CFU per gram of knot. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. then I didn't. Okay. So, so, so then we went to Cayo. One of my PhD students spent some time in Cayo, who has a beautiful system. I mean, he's, a, as I was saying, he's, a, and he's an incredibly nice guy in Malaga, professor in Malaga. And he has the epifluorescence. He has the confocal microscopy. And we co-infected all these. We did all these co-infections. Then we, you know, you make the red and green. Again, another revolution, you know, in bacteria. Thanks, uh, you know. Uh, and he, look at this, look up, this is, I mean, I get so excited, look at this. This is a biofilm inside the olive knot. Look at the red and green, they're making love, they're happy together. They're so beautiful together. You know, they don't kill each other, they, and, and basically, you know, uh, our data shows that the pathogen goes there, I take over, I make the niche, I'm 50% of the population, but so with some of the guys there, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have a good time, because actually, at the end of the day, we both benefit. And I don't know if I put this slide, no, I didn't put the slide. And then an em uh, we got an EMBO fellowship uh, from Cayo Lab because we, had, uh, we put the genomes together and we saw some metabolic complementarity. So we saw that some metabolic pathways were more complete when the two genomes are together. So we were looking at ways. We were looking whether the two bacteria together could be metabolically stronger. And we did, again, so much work, mutants, co-infection. And unfortunately, we were not able to show because our belief, our hypothesis is that there are some metabolism which is, uh, which is much more complete when the two bacteria are together compared to them being separate. Because there's a lot of compounds in plants, especially phenolics, that need to be degraded for food. And we think that together they can do it better. But unfortunately, you know, we have to show that. We didn't show that uh, after a lot of work. That happens a lot in our job. So. I just have three, four slides to finish. Just some, uh, so here, just some, some takeaway messages. And to finish, I will give you the takeaway messages in a couple of slides, but I just have a few minutes left. And um, what we're now finding also, because you know we isolate so many bacteria from the soil, from the rhizosphere, pathogens, we find bacteria more and more that have quorum sensing systems, like this one, this beautiful bacteria we work with. Actually, Misha is working here, it's a postdoc which has two quorum sensing systems, which we cannot switch on in the lab. So basically, they, they work because you know, we can 
take the genes and remove them from their regulatory components and we just fire them and they work, they make the signal, they respond to the signal, they bind the signal. Every, I mean, they're functional, they're not pseudogenes. But we cannot switch them on in the lab. Well, M Misha was able to do, to, to do that, to do some of that. So, it goes against the initial concept of quorum sensing, basal production, you know, and then a certain cell density switch on. It's actually not like that. The switching on mechanism is something that is really baffling us and the rest of the quorum sensing community because we're understanding there's, in many cases, there's much more to it than that. And, and, and one experiment that, that, that Misha did here, and it, these are just come out of the, come out of the, uh, come out of the microscope. These are, if we take this pseudomonas and we make it green with autofluorescent, constitutive green, autofluorescent protein, this is the wild type, right? And this is, uh, we're looking at one system in particular, and then we give it the signal that, that that the system, that the gene we know produces, we, we give it exogenously. You know, you can buy these signals uh, from Sigma. We give a lot of it. We saturate the, 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 the quantity of the signal. You can then see, sorry, I'm a bit daltonic here. It's just, the, the difference between these two panels, this is a, if it's on, it's yellow. Here, if it's on, it's blue. It's just a different color. It's exactly the same experiment. But you can see here, I can see some blue. So if you give it a lot of signal, you give it some, about 5% of the cells go on. Not all of them. And then, you know, Misha was playing with different, uh, with different uh, molecules to understand how it responds to the different molecules. And here we have a scenario where we identified the genetic element which was repressing the system, which is a repressor. If we inactivate that, that guy, we have 100% of the cells on. So here we don't add any HL, we just remove the repressor, then the bacteria make a lot of signals. But in this case, all of them are wrong. But if we give exogenous signal, the, sa the same that is making here, 5% are wrong. So help me, guys. I mean, we're, you know, maybe you guys have, you can model this, you can give us some idea. So, so this is, you know, the switching on off mechanism is, is, is really, is really, you know, so here we, are we saying, does, does this, System is this system repressed by this repressor because it responds to a to an environmental stimulus, or do we have like a stochastic switch on? Some of the cells just I don't know the repressor just doesn't work. Switch on and then and then throws out a lot of signal in that in that particular area, and then it switches on also the neighbors. So we're trying to understand, and these scenarios are getting more and more common. We're finding them, so we're trying to understand the switch on off mechanism, which is not as, as, uh, as straightforward as, we, as first postulated by this quorum sensing. Because again, don't forget, the Vibrio Fischeri, it is really a unique scenario where, where a homogeneous population is desired. So we want all the cells. We want to maximize bioluminescence production. Maybe there are other co community scenarios where you want to do some bed edging, you want to do some division of labor, you want to switch on off the system in a different way in order to optimize your, your chance of survival. So we must not take the Vibrio Fischeri as the, in my view, as the, as the uh, paradigm example. It's really an exceptional example. What, what we're finding now is that if we look at the signaling system, I've shown you specialization, you know, through Luxar solos, we see here the switch on and off much more complicated. Uh, so we are now thinking ways, we're now, we're now trying to, to understand uh, how uh, this cell-to-cell -cell signaling system really works in much more complex communities uh, associated with plants or in soils. And so, so you know, we just published, uh, actually, last week. So, uh, you know, we think that actually quorum sensing can regulate adaptive traits. It's much more than a cell density dependent switch. We really, we begin to argue that in the wild, we think quorum sensing promotes phenotypic heterogeneity, so it doesn't go towards a homogeneous response, but it goes towards a heterogeneous response, which has obvious advantages in a complex community. Or in a, or an environment where there's a lot of different types of food, a lot of different types of uh, competition scenarios. So basically, quorum sensing could enable some societal organization in bacteria. Basically, we, we published this, giving, a, giving an idea that we should really rethink and re-envision the way we, we see quorum sensing in, in bacteria. Uh, so basically, uh, I finished this is my last slide. Uh, since this is a really thinking environment, 
Um, uh, the thinking, the messages that maybe I can give here is the role of quorum sensing in complex plant and soil microbiome versus the disease, a disease environment. I think it's very different. And I've shown also that in a disease environment, there's also sharing of signals, which has not been shown very, yet very much in complex communities. Looks are solos, extremely widespread, much more than complete signaling systems. And that more diverse, much more specialized. Sorry, my, I just did this morning, my spelling went. Environmental effects on the signals. You know, these signals can be degraded by the environment, can be made unstable. You know, we know that, for example, alkali pH will degrade the signal. So the signal can be affected a lot by the environment, and that will change things a lot as well. Many different phenotypes are regulated by these systems, okay? Not all cells produce and respond to the signal if the system is saturated. That is really baffling to us. We give saturated level of signals, but only 5% of the cells are on. I just finished, and then, and then phenotypic heterogeneity. So this, so, and, and what I wanna say, for all these things that you guys are big thinkers, we have working models. So actually, we think we have, we can do quite simple experiments to, to, to validate maybe some of your simulations, some of your modeling. So we're very interested to, to, to get together with you thinkers and modelers that, that maybe can help us answer some of these questions that are now, because in my view, this field needs a revival. It's kind of quieting down because we found a lot of signals. We found a lot of, it, needs, it needs a revival, and it needs, we really need to understand this, uh, the real function of this system, how it's on off, and, how, and the real how it works in natura out there, rather than in a very simple uh, conical flask, pure of pure culture that has been studied so far. Up to now, it's basically been studied like that. Okay, so I finished, so uh, thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Vittorio. We have time for questions. I'll start here just because it's closer. All right. So may, maybe first, just a short remark for the case where 5% goes on when you give a saturating signal. Maybe look at whether there are differences in growth rate in the single cells that uh, distinguish which ones go on and which one don't go on. Right. So there's a stochastic variation growth rate. But so the question I want to ask is, it seems these cells put out hundreds of different kinds of chemical species as they're, as they're growing, as you're saying, streptomyces, 600 different metabolites, uh, right? So any one of these that couples to, to regulators inside other cells that can diffuse into other cells and couple to regulators there could act like a, a sensing signal for the presence of others. So then... I would sort of almost imagine that almost anything uh, could be a quorum sensing in the mm -hmm. sense that you sense who others are there because you see the molecules that, that others excrete. But then in most of your examples, there were like one or two families of regulators that were, that were basically implementing this. So this was somewhat... So do you think that this is just because that's where you're looking, that's sort of where the light is, and that there is a vastly larger number of regulators that are also acting like quorum sensors? Or do you think that there is something, some reason that the sort of the same regulators are used for this over and over? Yeah, I, I mean, uh, one of the most studied, probably the best studied organism for quorum sensing is Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and we are now at six signals. Uh, let's say we define a signal when, when uh, you know, it is true, uh, antibiotics have been shown to be signals, siderophores have been shown to be, so molecules which have a biological function for the bacteria, like taking up iron or fighting other. They've also been shown to have some signaling properties. But what I'm talking about here, pure signaling, uh, the, the function is a pure signaling function. Uh, so I, I, I agree, I mean, uh, I agree with you. Uh, it's much more complex, there's a lot of signals. Uh, we're trying to simplify, we're trying to, use this model because we know it's a signal. We have, uh, so we are trying to understand um, you know, how this model works and how this model benefits a community of cells. But again, the, 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 you know, uh, the vaso di Pandora that you're opening is, is, is out there and we're aware of it. Okay. Okay. About the 5%, uh, the growth rate is a possibility. I'm not a big believer of that because we grow them here in, in defined medium and, you know, 
uh, we think that the growth is pretty well controlled along, but again, it's something we need to look at. Hi, thank you for this talk. I was curious about the experiment where you saturated them with the signal, like, are they grown in planktonic cultures, like in liquid cultures, and then you add the signal and see the microscope what happens, or did you try also maybe uh, like... The first one, the, we, we grow, so far we grow them in planktonic, uh, so we grow them in liquid, uh, and with saturated signal, which we believe is it's very well distributed, so ideal, it's an ideal homogeneous scenario. And have you tried instead in like inducing the cultures like in other structures like biofilms? Oh. Because I was looking at all these pictures, like it looks like the spatial structure is very important, like in these nodes or yes, yes. gut, etc. We haven't we haven't done we haven't done sessile structures, we haven't done other media, but it's something that we again, we're just doing this stuff. So we start with the most simple defined way and then Try to understand that before we move on to anything else. Thank you. Is already this very simple setup is creating us a lot of questions. Yeah. Hi. Uh, two very stupid questions. Um, no. So first one, um, how do you know that the signal is saturated, actually? So the, okay, should be we, the internal concentration, not yeah, the yeah, concentration. Yeah, yeah we, know, we know the kind of concentration needed for the response. So here we put par excess. And uh, the, the, the second one is, uh, um, so you said that there are nine subgroups of uh, solos, right? Well, in Sulumon, in that so particular, in that particular part. Yeah. And uh, three, you know that there are two HL, yeah. and the other six you don't know, right? Well, one of them is responding to a plant signal, yeah. and the other three plus one, the other five we don't know. So how but do we don't think they respond to it. We don't have any evidence, but based on, we do cartography models. So a lot of these proteins have been crystallized together with signal with the HL signal. So there's a lot of structure information, right? So then I, here I collaborate with synchrotronic scientists and we do the modeling. So based on the modeling, we're pretty confident that three of subgroups are responding to the HLs based on the model, on the, also on the sequence and the modeling. One of them we know is planned because we have the evidence. The other four, uh, they don't fit any of the scenarios of the HLs or the plants. So it's, in my view, it's something else. In our view, something else. Uh, when I say something else, another, mo another signal, another molecule. Um, one question that I have is, so these molecules are really, is, they diffuse through the membranes, uh, and can they be used as carbon sources, mm -hmm. not just as regulators? Mm -hmm. They can be used as carbon sources. Uh, okay, so these molecules are made, for example, by gram-negative bacteria. Mm -hmm. You've heard a lot of Bacillus subtilis here, which is a gram-positive bacteria. And one scientist published in Nature, actually, Yanu Izang, a good friend of mine, published in 2001, that bacillus make lactonase enzymes, right? Uh, actually, in the case of bacillus, so the lactonase opens the ring, mm -hmm. but then as far as I know, it doesn't eat it. So it's like, a, it might, it's regarded more as like a defense, so to, to, to interfere with the signaling of another group of bacteria. But there are bacteria, especially gram-negative, that, that will use them. In fact, even the producers, at one point, when the quorum sensing, let's say, window finishes, like you know, the expression, then it starts degrading it for food. Okay, very interesting. Yes. Thank you. So what, what, what you discussed, the degradation of the signal is a factor that controls quorum sensing. Right? But then you make it and degrade it to control it if you have the on or off. But then the couldn't be the Luxar solos or like, I don't know, a six explanation of the Luxar solos related to this? that they actually sense it to just... Uh, Kill, eat it. Yeah. Why not? Yeah, why not? It could be. But, uh, uh, yeah. The, what, what I can say to you, uh, the concentration, these molecules work at nanomolar concentration. So you're not eating a lot of food here. Okay? So the, they, they work even, in, in some cases, even five nanomolar concentration. Uh, they work. So it's not that you're going to make a big, you're going to make a big deal. Eat, it's not a big buffet, you know? Very little food, yeah. Uh, so I have a question about the regulator that you deleted, I guess. Can you give some more insight into what you know about it, what it regulates, etc.? Which one? We the one with the, um, when you flood the system with the molecules, you don't see anything, and then when you delete, you suddenly see a very oh, strong... Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, this is, yeah, yeah. Thanks a lot for the question. Do you remember at the beginning of my talk, I, I said that I have a PhD student that spent a year setting up. So, so this is a repressor that represses the system, and it's not a DNA-binding protein. 
So we're trying to find out, going to your question, how does that repression works? Because I showed you a picture that a repressor binds DNA, blocks transcription. This repressor is so strong, and some US scientists were so fascinated, because it's unique also in bacteria. In fact, we're just gonna publish a review coming out in a couple of weeks. It's completely unique. So usually regulatory, you have these families in bacteria, you know, consisting of a lot of members. And this is the only unique scenario. We have only this repressor, and we don't know how it works. A scientist in, uh, in uh, in the US was so fascinated, he crystallized and made this structure, and he concluded from the structure, no DNA binding, it's no RNA binding, so we don't know how it represses transcription. So in my view, it, 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 it works with other proteins. It makes, inter it makes a, an interactome. So we need to find out that, and that's what I was saying at the beginning of my talk. There's a PhD student that is setting up the whole experiment. So he spent a whole year uh, doing all the constructs, and now hopefully we're very close to, to try to understand how, with which protein interacts to do this repression. Okay, and then the second question, I don't know if this is relevant, but if you um, don't just flood the system, do you see a different response? So if you kind of try out different concentrations of the uh, molecule that you think is sensed? Because it could also be that you somewhere like in between have an optimum for sensing. That's a good point. We haven't, I don't know, Misha, can you answer yeah. that? Yeah. So it's, uh, yeah. And that level is the 5% of the activity. So you saturate just a 0.5 micromolar. I'm maybe a little bit confused still about this. Uh, I think along what Eric was asking. I hope at least. Um, <laughs> the, is there a growth? I'm speed, confused, too, don't worry. A growth speed dependency. It seems like when you grow to 10 to the 9 cells, you're sort of going into stationary. And but he sort of uh, said that, well, you know, your signal capability is much higher suddenly. So you need a lot less signal as well mm -hmm. to, to do something. Is that something that's yeah. happening here, right? If you just take your, your cells and dilute them? Yeah. Uh, well, or what I, what I believe is important is that when cells are growing fast and happy, they don't do signaling. This signaling happens sta at stationary phase when cells are, are, are not growing fast. Because the reason I say that is because what, they regu what, what is regulated by the system are phenotypes related to survival, are related, you know, they make things that uh, it makes sense to make them when you are not growing or when you're in trouble. So if you're growing fast, uh, in my view, and data is there that cell-to-cell -cell signaling is really quorum sensing behavior, social, it's, it's not happening as much. So when you have stationary phase, and then again, you can have stationary phase at very low cell density. So stationary phase is not related to cell density. You know? If you have a very poor medium, you can have very low number of cells which are physiologically a low, a low state. But I believe there you probably have signaling as well. So you, 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 I mean, it's something I need to think about, but it's definitely growth phase and cell-to-cell -cell signaling is very closely correlated. Very, very, yeah. If you make movies and you do this when cells are growing happily, doubling every 20 minutes, you don't see this. Has it all the time. Um, do you have an idea of um, how many different types of such signaling molecules are used by bacteria, you know, across the, the spectrum of uh, bacteria? How many such signaling molecules exist? And what, is what, yeah, is what he said, a lot. <laughs> but we're lot, really, yes. we're, the problem is, yeah, we're not discovering them as fast as we should, but there's a lot. I, I'm a believer that every bacteria makes at least one signal, 
at least speaks a language. But then it can speak other languages, it can listen to languages of others, but at least it has its own mother tongue, right? Uh, and then, and then it will have, other, and then it will, might have more uh, languages. It might respond to other. So it's 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 what we're beginning to see that as this bacteria that we studied in detail, which is a plant, human pathogen, they already found six. And what makes it more complicated? They're interconnected. They're hierarchical. So it's complex. So um, just to continue uh, a little bit, that um, you know, you showed an example of where these two bacteria um, were uh, having a mutualistic. Uh, yeah. uh, interaction. Yeah. Now, um, in general, uh, when you have uh, microbiomes which contain a large number of bacterial species, is there um, a way to estimate, you know, that this kind of a signaling uh, that is that is going on between how many pairs of species, or uh, uh, does one have any idea at all? I mean, there's there is cross feeding. I think uh, Martina asked that question. Yeah, there's, yeah. there's a lot of cross feeding. There's that's hardly on, any data. There's no data. Hardly any data. Mm -hmm. we, we've written about this. I can, we've also written about this. Because, because the marvelous world of bacteriology in the last 10 years discovered incredible, uh, in, uh, uh, fascinating cell-to-cell uh, -cell communicating systems. You know, both contact-dependent and contact-independent. You know, I don't know if you've heard about the secretion system. So now bacteria can, can, can make these needles that will inject proteins into other bacteria. They are vesicles, they are nanotubes. Here we have cell-to-cell -cell signals. So there are many mechanisms, are, they share metabolites. Uh, so there are many mechanisms by which microbes can communicate in a microbiome. Don't, don't go home thinking, oh, this is the only way, diffusible signals. Contact-independent signals is one way. There's contact-dependent, there's a plethora of mechanisms that, bacteria, that microbes can use to, to have micro-microbe interactions. And many microbes have all these, you know, this bacteria, have, they can inject proteins in other bacteria. They have, make vesicles and they can, so there's a lot of different, signaling is one and there's a lot of other mechanisms they can use. Complex. So which, which one to use when and when to switch on one with respect to the other, it's something that, that is extremely interesting. And what is the role also in, in, in the microbiome? We have very little data because as I said, we're work, us bacteriologists, we're working in pure, culture in pure systems in labs. We need to move away from this and start, start going into the wild and seeing what, the, as you're saying, what is the role in the wild of all these mechanisms. Hardly any data on that. It's not easy to do, but. Uh... My question is, are there any known cases of coupled um, quorum sensing and uh, chemotaxis, like where the signal could be an attractant or repellent for chemotaxis? I understand you. I do. Again, is the question that a uh, colleague said. Um, not that I'm aware of, but it wouldn't surprise me. Unfortunately, this world is, we've had a, if you look at the PubMed, we've had a, a big surge of scientists studying this these, uh, this topic. And, uh, and now through funding, especially in the US and Europe, is now, is now we, we need, it's now going down a lot, unfortunately. We need to, we need to revive it a little bit. Any other question? Also, because one of the one of the reasons that one of the reasons that that it kind of lost a bit of lost, lost a bit of momentum because you remember the Trojan horse I showed you. It's actually it's actually uh, what is what is actually evident now is that if you're infected, it's too late. It's too late if you go with a with a drug that blocks quorum sensing. It's too late because quorum sensing hap is important. At the, at, at the initial phases of the infection, at the establishment. So uh, if you have a biofilm in your lungs, for example, as in it's the case of, for example, cystic fibrosis patients, the anti quorum sensing drug will not work. It's too late. So basically, you need to work the, you need to take the anti quorum sensing drug all the time to prevent the formation of the biofilm. So this is, has lost a lot of interest in terms of utilizing this system as, a, as an application, if you follow me, okay? Yep. Which is a pity. So very, very little philosophical questions. So you said, great, great, great uh, presentation, Vittorio. But you said that the quorum sensing could be a major driver of phenotypic uh, diver diversification. In metagenomics, usually we cannot argue when you do the bioinformatics stuff or whatever, you can find a lot of bacteria, a lot of fungi, a lot of viruses, et cetera, et cetera. But, uh, 
especially for the bacteria world uh, within the metagenomics, uh, we cannot argue what are the drivers of this diversification of the number of species that within a single sample we can, we can find. Sometimes we can find 600 species, 300, sometimes Talking one the gut. within the gut, mm. or within the tongue, or whatever. And um, only, don't go to the, the soil, soil because you multiply that by... Exactly, yeah, yeah, also yeah. in the soil community. So, from the philosophical point of view, the quorum sensing, uh, uh, the looks are solo system, could be, a, could be a major driver for the diversification of species in, 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 in the terms because if we should have within a bacterial community two species, three species, four species, or strains, we could have a diversification, uh, an obligation of a diversification to converge within a single function. For example, survive within an environment. Why, a, in your opinion, why a single species could not be sufficient to thrive within an environment, for example, the, the nodes, the olive nodes, and if the quorum system could be a system that the evolutionary is uh, demanding uh, and is demanded, is evolutionary to, mm, to, to share something between different species uh, to thrive within an, within, uh, an environment. So it's a sort of trade-off uh, to I, I, diversify as a bottom-up approach uh, or top-down. I'm a strong believer of this. Mm -hmm. And uh, also answering the question of a previous uh, mm -hmm. colleague, exactly. we are now setting up synthetic communities of we're trying to simplify a, a, root, a root microbiome. We have the data of um, the number of protobacteria, the phyla, you know. So we're, we're simplifying a microbiome up down to 30, 40 species, and we're beginning to work with this. It's not easy with this simplified microbiome to try and answer questions like this. So this is, I think, us and other scientists are working with what called synthetic communities in the lab to try and answer some of these questions and trying to look at cell-to-cell signaling in a... In a, in a in a more pertinent scenario uh, that reflects to what goes back in the wild. So this is the way us and others are going. We are we're making small microbiomes uh, and start doing some of these experiments. Okay. But happy to, 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 to team up with, with, uh, with you guys for, for ideas, thinking, and, and models and simulations which can help us design our experiments. Any other question? Okay, let's thank that's Vittorio. It,